My digestive issues were horrible. I had unbearable pain, bloating that made my belly feel like I was pregnant half the time. I can actually remember on Thanksgiving Day of 2019, I went off of my restrictive diet that I was using to manage things at the time, and I basically had everything that I wanted to at that dinner. And then I came home and I took my shirt off and I looked at myself in the mirror and I literally broke down into tears because of how distended and bloated and painful my gut was. It literally looked like I had a medicine ball in my abdomen. I could go weeks without having a bowel movement. I could not eat for days on end and still have zero appetite. If you were to imagine the absolute worst stomach ache you've ever had in your life, and then extend that out for about two or three years, that was the reality of the life that I was living. So of course, I went to multiple healthcare experts in order to try to remedy the situation to very little avail. I was in a very fortunate situation where I could afford to go to some of the so-called top experts in the field. And I went to numerous of these gastroenterologists. I got passed around from doctor to doctor, probably over 10 different tests done. And after all of that, I was still left empty handed. They had no answers for me. They pretty much just told me the best that you can do is manage it. You need to eat a low fat plant-based diet and you would probably be best served to take this drug for the rest of your life for the foreseeable future. I had one GP tell me that it was all in my head and that I just needed to relax and go out and eat a pizza. And I was very angry about that at first until I had another top gastroenterologist expert tell me that there was nothing really wrong with me and it was just my diet. And if I just went on this low fat plant based diet, that I would be okay. And then I can remember very distinctly. I had to go through a whole colonoscopy prep, which if you've ever had one, you know how unpleasant it is. I went through the whole prep. I didn't eat for two days. I was having extremely watery bowel movements every 30 minutes for two days. I could barely sleep. And then I went to get the colonoscopy. Lo and behold, it showed absolutely nothing. And I remember sitting in the hospital bed with my parents, with uh, the gastroenterologist who had just walked in. And he said, yeah, you're all clean. There's nothing wrong with you. And I just looked at him and I said, okay, well, I haven't eaten anything in two days. There's literally no mass whatsoever inside of my body. You literally just looked inside me with a camera and there's nothing remaining. Yet I am still sitting here with this pain, this bloating, this burning in my digestive system. And I basically asked him for an answer and he kind of just stood there blankly with no answer. And we sat there in silence uh, in the hospital bed. And I was extremely frustrated because I think he knew that I knew that he had no idea what he was talking about. Then I went to a few alternative doctors, more holistic style doctors. And again, while they did seem to have more options for me and things that I was a bit more aligned with ideologically, nothing that they offered was really moving the needle to where I needed it to be. So I just want to start off with a disclaimer that nothing that I am saying is medical advice. This is just my opinion. This is informational. I'm not telling you to stop going to a doctor. If you are currently doing that, please do not do that based off of this video. However, I do want to talk about all of the pitfalls of modern medicine and with so-called holistic medicine when it comes to dealing with these sort of nondescript digestive problems. And the first thing that we really need to address in order to understand this is the philosophy of modern medicine and why it's really doomed to start from the beginning. You start off with the notion that if you have some sort of chronic health problem, that everything is idiopathic. That's the medical term for we have no idea why it started. And then they will also say that things are chronic, meaning that they cannot be cured no matter what you do. You can just live with them, and at best, you can manage them. Another key component of the philosophy of modern medicine is that it is really all about authoritarianism in the sense that there is very little active participation for a patient or for someone that is struggling with health problems. Rather, it is more about following orders rather than actively participating and really listening to the body to do what the individual thinks is best for them. 
I truly do not believe that true health can be achieved without this type of conscious intention from the individual. Maybe at some point in the past when the environment was a little bit more conducive to being healthy, that this wouldn't be the case. However, in today's environment, I really truly do believe that if you are going to live a truly healthy, fulfilling, and euphoric type of life with the vibrant health that you really deserve, then you do need to be intentional about it and you do need to listen to your body and you need to learn how your body works. However, modern medicine removes all of this from the equation and they replace it with 15 minute sessions of either calls or brief meetings and then they give you some kind of sheet and then you're out the door and you aren't really thinking about it until it's too late. Finally, the philosophy of modern medicine is doomed from the start because really there is no philosophy. There's no underlying framework or foundational set of ideas about what actually governs health, what makes a person healthy, what biological processes should we be striving for to make the person not only digest their food better, but have overall a higher quality of life and better long-term health. That does not seem to exist in modern medicine. The philosophy of modern medicine tends to be very robotic, i.e. if you think about it, if someone has a tumor, okay, then we're going to remove it. If someone has inflammation, then we're going to give them a drug to suppress it. If someone is sad, then we're going to give them a pill that makes them not sad. In reality, there's no coherence to this process. You're simply playing molecular whack-a-mole where you fix one problem and then another one arises. And I do just want to say, I'm not trying to throw shade on doctors. I know that they often have hearts of gold. They go into this incredibly stressful lifestyle and accumulate all sorts of debt and go through the ringer in medical school and residency and all these things, their training, they do all this because they are trying to help people. And I am not trying to shed blame on individual doctors, but what I am saying is that I think they are put in a very poor position to succeed and they may not have the right resources or the right intellect in order to address these problems as they should be. They need to see an incredibly high volume of patients, which means that they can't really focus as much attention on one patient as they would like. They don't have a ton of time to personalize their plans for their patients. And finally, working in medicine can be absolutely exhausting, and people really don't seem to have the bandwidth to be reading research and keeping up with modern theories about what creates health and you know the latest biochemical research. There's a very famous quote that says, half of what you'll learn in medical school will be shown to be either dead wrong or out of date within five years of your graduation. The trouble is that nobody can tell which half. So the most important thing is to learn how to learn on your own. Now, you can imagine how bad this can get for doctors that have been in practice for decades, maybe went to medical school literally a half a century ago and are still practicing. And that's just scratching the surface based on research. That's not even getting into reading older research, reading historical evidence, just sitting back and taking some time to really digest and think about these things in context, noticing patterns with their patients and taking that type of data and trying to understand what works and what doesn't. And then ultimately trying to come up with a comprehensive theory that can explain it all. At the end of the day, doctors are just one individual, and no matter how hard they try, one man or one woman is a bit limited in scope. This is exemplified in a quote from a survey of IBS patients who said more than half of IBS patients reported that they feel their healthcare providers have an inadequate understanding of their struggles with their symptoms. That can be absolutely devastating if you are trying to deal with a health problem and you feel like no one else understands it. Then there's also the fact that trying to just figure things out on your own is actually more likely to work in certain analyses than going the standard healthcare route. 58% of IBS cases in children went away completely within five years, and this was more likely to happen without any medical treatment. How can you have faith in the medical system when it's literally more advantageous in many circumstances to forego it entirely? Then if we want to talk about the actual testing that gastroenterologists or different doctors will do in order to assess these digestive concerns, they are largely image-based. So they are trying to address structural abnormalities, physical abnormalities in the gut 
that are visible to the human eye. And then after this, they try to put you in a box of different diagnoses, whether that is inflammatory bowel disease or having stomach ulcers or gastritis. And then if all of that fails and they can't find anything and they can't put you in one of these boxes, then they do one of two things. They will tell you A, that it's all in your head and that you're just imagining these things, or that you have a functional problem, something like dyspepsia or the infamous irritable bowel syndrome or IBS. In reality, anyone can understand that IBS is a very misleading and ultimately useless term because it is a diagnosis of exclusion and it's not actually telling you anything about the condition. You're simply saying, well, you have gut problems and you don't have any ulcers or any macroscopic inflammation that we can see on the scope, but you still have symptoms, so you have irritable bowel syndrome. Then at this point, they will do what they did with me, which is tell you you can go on a drug for life and you can eat a very bland, boring diet in hopes of managing it. The bottom line with all of this is that people get put into an if-then system and the final then when none of the other ifs apply, is limbo. You are likely going to need a comprehensive all hands on deck approach to fixing these problems because ultimately health problems are simply the manifestation of problems with the environment on your body. And you can think of changes in the environment as how you live. So how can you expect to change your condition if you don't change how you live? I got that from Danny Roddy, by the way. So if we actually get into some of the science of where conventional wisdom fails, there are a few key interventions that they will often recommend that are not at all backed by the latest medical research. The first one that they often will discuss is simply drinking more water. And I suppose that the rationale here is that if you have excess stool built up in your gut, well, it might be dry, it might not be coming out for a reason, therefore you should just drink more water to sort of lubricate things and get it out, and that should help. However, the reality of the situation is that people with chronic constipation actually do not drink less water on average. So right off the bat, you are left with the very obvious notion that drinking more water is not going to be the solution that you are looking for. In fact, in certain analyses, they've actually found an increased risk of IBS mixed for the highest amount of drinking water. Then there's also the fact that the gut actually handles anywhere from seven to 10 liters of fluid each day, which is right around two and a half gallons of water. So adding another cup or two, or even another liter of water on top of what your body naturally craves is unlikely to really do anything in the grand scheme of things. The most important thing to understand here is that water handling in the colon, which is a very dynamic and important process, is really most regulated by energy and by stress. These are the things that determine how much water goes into the cells of your colon, how much gets left in the luminal space of the colon, so left for the fecal material, or how much water goes into the rest of your body. All of that is regulated by energy and by stress, not necessarily just how much fluid you are taking in. Then of course, there is the issue of fiber, and this is probably the most recommended dietary intervention that you will hear if you have gut issues, yet it seems to be lacking in efficacy to say the absolute least. A massive patient survey showed that up to 76% of all IBS patients are given this suggestion by their doctors, yet just 5 to 13% of patients report high satisfaction. In other words, it gets recommended almost all the time and almost nobody ever actually benefits from it. In fact, there are several studies showing that reducing or stopping dietary fiber intake entirely is incredibly efficacious in alleviating all of the key symptoms of gut issues. So abdominal pain, bloating, gas, constipation, diarrhea. In fact, there was one study that showed complete resolution in every single individual who was struggling with these symptoms, swapping out whole grain for white bread and white rice, swapping out whole vegetables for fruit juices and vegetable juices that were strained. Yeah, it seems to go completely against what you are told by your gastroenterologist. However, that is the reality of the situation. In fact, it's pretty well understood that if you have any of these chronic inflammatory gut conditions like diverticulitis or inflammatory bowel disease, 
that eating more fiber is one of the most reliable ways to cause a flare up. And if someone is having some struggles with their condition, one of the easiest, simplest, and most efficacious things to do in that scenario is to actually remove out all of the fiber from the diet for the time being. The main actions of fiber are twofold. So there are actually two different types of fiber. There's soluble fiber, and then there's insoluble fiber. And there's obviously a lot more different specific types of fiber, but those are the two broad categories that we're going to talk about. Soluble fiber mainly exerts its action by slowing down digestive function and serving as substrate to feed to the bacteria throughout the gut, whereas insoluble fiber works by tending to speed up the GI process and it does not serve as fuel for any of the bacteria. It goes completely undigested throughout the GI tract and because of that, it can cause some serious irritation. Now, it does increase the bulk of the stool. In other words, it makes you produce more poop. However, if you are struggling with a gut issue, it is very likely that you already are producing far too much stool. This has been shown repeatedly that even people that have multiple regular bowel movements, their symptoms can still be traced back to the fact that they are retaining a large amount of fecal material. So in the case of fiber, why would you think that something that either feeds the bacteria in the gut, which is what compromises most of your stool, or adding something to directly bulk the stool is actually going to help the problem? Of course it's not. You need to figure out why you are producing too much of this stool and address it accordingly. As a matter of fact, eating more fiber in this instance is more likely to worsen your symptoms than anything. It just adds fuel to the fire. And then in the case of insoluble fiber, they've actually done studies showing that you can ingest plastic chips to induce the same response that you would get to insoluble fiber. So we are really talking about a very indigestible material here that acts as a mechanical irritant to your colon. However, again, if you have digestive issues, your gut is already very sensitive to irritation, so you do not want to be adding in more bulking indigestible material. And feeding fiber to individuals with these issues is known to cause a rise in the production of a multitude of different gases, which can slow down the motility even further, contribute to constipation, contribute to pain, bloating, of course, gas symptoms. So it's really not something that you want to add if your gut is not ready for it. Another thing that is often recommended by the mainstream healthcare system is exercise. And while this is a good idea in theory, in practice, it doesn't seem to have much efficacy. It tends to be a very non-specific recommendation. In other words, yeah, just go get some exercise. And then the other problem is that people with these issues are typically already in a lot of pain, discomfort, and are already chronically fatigued. So telling them to just go get some exercise is not exactly the most helpful thing in most scenarios. And it can even lead to an exacerbation of symptoms if people are going too intense and stressing themselves out too much, again, because the gut is very sensitive in this state, especially to stress. And in fact, it's pretty common that some of the people with the worst digestive issues are very lean, active athletes. And I think that has a lot to do with the diet, but it's also because they are under a tremendous amount of stress. And that's something that I can definitely speak to because when I first developed these problems, I was much leaner than I am now. And I was a gym maniac and I was heavily restricting my food so that I can maintain a very lean physique. The next thing that is often recommended in the mainstream healthcare is probiotics or fermented foods. And there are a number of issues with implementing these things right off the bat if you are dealing with digestive issues. The first problem that needs to be discussed is that the composition of the gut bacteria is still largely unknown. There is a ton of research going on in the field right now. It's a bit of a renaissance, but even just 10 years ago, a lot of what we know now about the gut flora was in its infancy in research, let alone 20 or 30 years ago. And ultimately, it's so vast and it differs so much from person to person in context to context that it might be a little bit of fool's gold to say you can just take a certain type of bacteria and expect everything to just be okay. And again, I want to emphasize that if you have these digestive issues, you already probably have too much bacteria. 
even in your colon where the bacteria is supposed to be, that's where all of the stool is getting produced. Your stool is mostly bacteria. And if you are producing lots and lots of stool and it is contributing to these symptoms, as it seems to be the case in these digestive conditions, then the last thing that you would want to do is just add more bacteria to the system. Even if these bacteria are considered commensal or, you know, typically have co-evolved with humans are supposed to exist in the colon, these bacteria can still produce these gases as fermentation byproducts. So hydrogen and carbon dioxide are very common. And the levels of these gases, again, are elevated in people with these nondescript gut issues. So ultimately, at the end of the day, you probably have too much bacteria in general, regardless of whether or not they are considered good or bad. An easy way to check for this, in my experience, has been to look at the coating of your tongue. When you wake up in the morning, if you stick out your tongue and you notice there is a white film or a coat on it, or generally you just have this feeling like there's some kind of dirtiness going on in your mouth, then that is a very good indicator that your gut motility is impaired and that there is some kind of bacterial overgrowth going on in the intestines. Because what people may not understand is that the mouth to the anus is actually one just big tube, basically. So if you have a bacterial overgrowth that is originating in the large intestine, the motility can be impaired and that can make its way all the way up to the mouth. Another thing that's important to consider with probiotics and fermented foods is that if you are struggling with one of these issues, then you are probably already in a state of hypometabolism and your gut probably has a significant degree of intestinal permeability, meaning things can just cross the gut lining non-specifically. And you also probably have a significant degree of impaired immunity. And in this case, any type of bacteria can be harmful. It does not matter if the bacteria is considered good or bad. If it actually gets into the inside of your body, in other words, crossing the intestinal barrier, then any type of bacteria is going to be a problem. It's kind of like if you think about getting a cut, any type of bacteria that goes in there and gets into you know, your skin and into your systemic is going to cause a serious problem. It's going to cause an infection. It's going to cause a lot of pain and inflammation. But if you don't have a cut on your skin, then nothing's going to get in. You're not just going to randomly start getting inflammation from bacteria if they are kept on the outside. And yes, our skin actually has its own microbiome. There are plenty of commensal organisms that live on your skin that are just fine when they're kept on the outside. And it's a similar phenomenon that's going on in your gut. So if you're in a situation where you already have impaired immunity and resistance to that infection, adding in more bacteria can be harmful. There was one excellent study showing that a lot of people who had bacterial overgrowth were taking probiotics because they thought that it would help, probably as a result of their doctors telling them so. Yet in this study, when they took out the probiotics from their protocol and then they gave them antibiotics, they actually got cured, not just of their gut symptoms, but also of their other symptoms like brain fog. This can largely be the result of something called D-lactic acid. So lactic acid is normally produced, you've probably heard about it, in terms of exercise, it gives you that burning feeling. So lactic acid is something our bodies normally produce. However, D-lactic acid is something that's only produced by bacteria. And if the levels of D-lactic acid rise systemically, it can be a pretty potent neurotoxin in the sense that it can lead to all different types of symptoms. It can lead to the slurring of speech, and it really leads to this sort of nondescript brain fog. Then there is the issue of histamine production. Histamine is another key component to these digestive issues. Antihistamines can often be extremely beneficial to people dealing with these issues, but histamine in general tends to be this inflammatory component that activates all the immune cells in the gut, and this can lead to a number of different symptoms. However, a lot of probiotics will actually contain histamine in them, or the bacteria that they contain will be histamine producing bacteria. That is to say that the fermented food or the probiotic that you take, those bacteria can actually produce histamine on their own, which is probably not a good thing if you are dealing with one of these problems. Then of course we have the issue of serotonin and serotonin is going to get its own entire video just like this, 
explaining why it is so detrimental to gut function, but long story short, it is produced in response to bacterial overgrowth or any type of irritation that's going on in the gut. And it really tends to mediate a lot of these symptoms. So things like altered bowel habits, pain, bloating, and any type of bacteria, again, regardless of what type it is, is capable of activating the part of the gut immune system that triggers the production of serotonin. People with these gut problems uniformly have elevated levels of serotonin in their gut. Now, it is the case that some of these probiotics can actually lower serotonin for reasons that we'll get to shortly. The bottom line is that probiotics and fermented foods certainly can be helpful in the right circumstance, but in my opinion, they are unlikely to be sufficient, especially as a first option, and they definitely are not going to be the cure to your problems, especially the way that they are implemented in modern medicine. Doctors are very rarely specific about the brand, the dosing, the duration, the different strains of probiotics. Not all probiotics are created equal, so just telling someone to just go and take a probiotic, which is something that doctors have told me in the past, is incredibly unhelpful and can actually make things worse. So with all of this confusion, I felt like I was in a place of pretty much no return. And then when I was able to figure things out, I wanted to spread the word far and wide. And that is exactly why we created Prism. Prism is our premium health consulting platform where we take a gut focused approach to your health issues. And we really aim to address all of the current problems that exist with the standard care. So we're constantly updating our research and Prism is very highly research backed. We actually have a team of practitioners. So it's never just one person looking at your case and we're constantly exchanging research and different experiences, different ideas with each other. It's really, truly powerful. We take an individualized and root cause approach to issues. We also believe that everything is fixable and that you're never just stuck with a given problem that you have. We will always keep trying new things. Everything is streamlined and your lab orders are discounted, sometimes up to 90 to 95% if you work with Prism. And above all, we have a comprehensive theory of what actually creates health, and that is the bioenergetic paradigm, essentially the idea that increasing the amount of energy flow through the organism and lowering the amount of stress that an individual experiences is really the key to health and what drives health and disease. So if you have been struggling with these types of issues and you are in a situation like I was, we would absolutely love to try to help you. I've unfortunately become a bit of an expert myself just reading hundreds and hundreds of research articles over the years trying to figure this thing out. But because of that, my role at PRISM is to really oversee all of these scientific operations. And then Jack, who is the other half of Analyze and Optimize, will walk you through the entire service. If you want to sign up for a first free console, you can click the top right of the screen here for that. So this begs the question, are alternative doctors or so-called holistic practitioners any better? And again, I want to preface my comments by saying it's not that they are completely useless or that they don't have good points or that their heart is not in the right place. They do tend to be more root cause approach. In other words, they try to nail down what the causes of your symptoms are and address that rather than just trying to mitigate symptoms. They also do focus a lot on diet and lifestyle, which is obviously the most important levers that you can pull in this scenario. But ultimately, I think that they can fall into a lot of similar pitfalls as the standard care. One of the things that I see very often with these types of approaches are very restrictive diets. And I think that this is seriously a problem because it kind of teaches people that over time, the answer to your problems is to continue to reduce and restrict and cut things out of your life rather than striving towards restoring the wholeness of life. Ultimately, people can end up backing themselves into a corner where they only feel comfortable eating one or two foods and they don't really go out because they're scared of eating restaurant food or they don't want to go out for a night of drinks with their friends and they can't even drink coffee, which is obviously not a life that anyone should have to live. This often involves things like restricting carbohydrates, lots of fasting, and elimination diets. Now, I did just say that I think it can be very therapeutic to remove fiber from the diet, and now I'm starting to tell you that elimination diets are bad. However, it's important to understand that these things both have utility in the short term. These are not diets that you want to be on forever, 
They are simply a means to an end. I don't think you can truly heal or even call it healing if you can only eat a handful of foods and need to live in a very regimented style in order to maintain your health. Holistic doctors also tend to love recommending things like gut or parasite cleanses. Now, I think that this can possibly be harmful because the gut is a very delicate environment and I don't think that you just want to loosey-goosey start ripping things out. And then there's also the fact that parasites may be a bit overstated in terms of how often they are causing these issues. Now, they can often be present on stool tests, but to the degree that that is actually leading to your symptoms is highly variable. And I don't think in the vast majority of cases, parasites are driving things. And then they will also recommend prebiotics. And prebiotics are essentially carbohydrates that are fermentable by bacteria. So it's a lot like the fiber argument, except it is introducing carbohydrates that are specifically fermentable, which is probably even worse. They also may introduce large volumes of sort of untargeted supplements. A lot of times people end up not wanting to take a bunch of drugs, but then they just end up taking a bunch of supplements indefinitely instead, which is not much better. They also are advocates for things like meal replacement shakes, which I am not particularly a fan of. In general, I think things can get a bit abstract and not very rigorous or analytical when there are terms like adrenal fatigue and there are then tied in concepts like, oh, if you have adrenal fatigue, then you should eat adrenal glands. Now, I am a fan of eating liver, especially for liver health, but there's more reason to it than just like solves like. And again, there is no overarching view of what actually creates good health or systemic health. Now, I would like to say that both the modern medicine standard healthcare approach and the holistic sort of alternative views, they both do have their benefits. Mainly, I think modern medicine tends to be more rigorous and analytical, whereas functional medicine tends to be more right in terms of the philosophy of how they operate. And again, that is exactly what we wanted to accomplish with PRISM. We wanted to sort of bring the best of both worlds. So really taking a personalized individual approach, but also being highly analytical. So now we can talk a little bit about some of the things of what to do instead. And again, I would like to reiterate that this is not medical advice. These are just things that I probably would do if I were in such a scenario. Overall, any therapeutic approach needs to hit a few key boxes. Number one, you want to decrease the fecal load and the bacterial load that is going on in the gut. You also want to decrease the irritation and specifically the serotonin production that's going on in the gut. And most importantly of all, you want to increase energy production, which is what holds everything about you together, but especially your gut. This is most notably seen in gut motility, which is often impaired in these issues, and the impaired motility allows bacteria to feed on the food for longer, and that can subsequently lead to these overgrowths and these symptoms. Energy also is what tends to regulate the bacterial composition, so it's not as simple as just eating bacteria or eating fiber for a given gut microbiome composition, really it's the health of the host that ends up governing these things. Organisms that we tend to consider more pathogenic really don't survive well in the conditions of a healthy human, where the stomach is very acidic, the colon is slightly acidic, motility is high, the immune system is strong, and there's very little oxygen leaking into the gut. Under those conditions, you're very unlikely to develop an infection or a bacterial overgrowth because your system is robust. The bacteria that do exist in that environment tend to be the commensal organisms, even the ones that are sold in probiotics. So this is all to say that the health of the host is a large governor of the bacterial composition, but of course it goes both ways. And the bacterial composition also has a large impact on your health. So you need to really address things from both angles. You can't just focus on one without the other. And most of all, it needs to be something that is sustainable. And before I get into this, I do want to say that this is not a comprehensive list of every single thing that you should do. And what this is definitely not is me saying, okay, go do every single one of these things. The most important thing is to listen to your body and your intuition. It will guide you. So in terms of the whole water thing, I mean, this is pretty obvious. I think you should just drink as much water as you desire. In reality, keeping a hydrated system is really about minerals. It's about having enough carbohydrate. 
and it is about getting enough fluid. That is how you can be truly hydrated on a cellular level. And something like magnesium is especially important for being hydrated in the colon. I've already touched on this before, but I think you would probably be best served to go on a very low fiber or low residue diet. Even the major health organizations, gastroenterologist associations recognize that these diets are incredibly effective at short-term mitigating symptoms, again, of some of these more serious gut conditions. So I think in general, you are going to want to limit the more fibrous foods, the nuts, the beans, the vegetables, even some whole fruits, um, and even starches can be highly fermentable. That is to say that I think the bulk of the diet should come from animal foods and from simple carbohydrates, so things like juices, or things that are very well-cooked starches, not undercooked starches. So if you think of a potato, you could think of a lightly cooked baked potato that's still kind of hard versus mashed potatoes would be much more digestible and less fermentable. And yes, this is completely the opposite of what the mainstream will tell you, which is to eat small meals very frequently and a low-fat plant-based diet. Yet here I am telling you to cut out the vegetables and the whole grains and the beans. Yes. Now, small amounts of insoluble fiber can be helpful for stimulating gut motility to a degree. I think it really depends on the individual. If your gut is very sensitive, then I would probably stay away from this. However, a lot of people do get benefits from things like the carrot salad. Now, if the problem is more targeted to the small intestine, something like a low FODMAP diet can be incredibly helpful. In this case, you are keeping in more fiber, but you are limiting some of the other fermentable carbohydrates in the diet. So things like isolated fructose or lactose, etc. I also think that the diet should be as diverse as possible. The reality is that the gut does adapt to the environment very well. There's an entire gut immune system and you can think of, you know, you catch a virus and then you become immune to that virus. It's the same thing with food. If you don't eat different foods, you will lose tolerance to those foods. The bacterial composition in the gut will reflect that and the gut immune system will affect that. Overall, you want to get to a state one day where you don't have to think about the foods that you are eating, at least to the degree that you're probably thinking of it right now. You should be able to go out with your friends, eat a couple tacos, have a couple beers, and be pretty much fine. Now, that's not me saying that you should just be able to go out and gorge on a bunch of McDonald's every day, but you should be in a state where you can tolerate a large variety of foods. Another thing that I think is very important here is the inclusion of carbohydrates and not fasting. So this goes pretty much extremely against what the alternative or holistic approach is, but there are a few key reasons for this. Number one, keeping the carbohydrates up is one of the most important ways to lower your systemic stress levels. And stress is really a common theme in all of these digestive disorders. But unfortunately, most of the time, the advice when it comes to stress is, you know, just chill out basically. In reality, you're going to have a tough time chilling out if your body does not have the biological tools in order to facilitate that. Stress is exceptionally damaging to the immune system over time. And this is particularly important in the gut where 70% of the immune system resides. Then there's also the fact that a lot of these cells that line the intestine that produce mucus, that produce antimicrobial peptides, and the ones that are actually absorptive and you know uptake your food, those actually rely on sugar in order to sustain their energy output. Then there's also the fact that extended fasting has been shown to raise the levels of serotonin in the gut. And this is actually sort of an adaptive hibernation mechanism. So yeah, not eating carbohydrates and Fasting a lot is a good way to make sure that your immunity is impaired and your serotonin in the gut is highly elevated. I talked a little bit about coffee before and how you're often told to not drink it. However, if you tolerate coffee well, and not everybody does, but if you get a high quality coffee, like our buddies from Edge Coffee, then it can be an incredibly valuable tool for increasing the motility, increasing stomach acid, which is central to all of this, as well as increasing motility and bowel movements. Now, if you don't tolerate coffee very well, I would probably recommend trying a very pure brand. And uh, that is why we partnered with Edge Coffee, who has extremely pure mycotoxin-free coffee. And you can check that out with this link. 
Of course, there are a number of lifestyle factors that are incredibly important to implement as well. So I talked a little bit before about exercise, and I would like to say that movement in general is important, but it's just the context that is important. I think walking outside is incredibly beneficial for your gut motility and for your overall stress levels, especially if you can do it in a setting that is more nature oriented as opposed to a setting that is more urban oriented. Yeah, that actually tangibly lowers your stress hormone output. In general, things need to be moving in the gut to keep things regular and to keep things uh, optimized. So you need to move a little bit in order to facilitate that. In general, I touched on this a little bit before with the diet that you want it to be as diverse as possible. And I think that it's the same when it comes to your lifestyle. I think you want to have as diverse a lifestyle as possible. You want to be experiencing different things. You want to be hanging around different people, being in different environments. And the importance of having a diverse life and diet is that the diversity in your gut bacteria is influenced by the diversity in your life. I mean, it kind of makes perfect sense. And this diversity in the gut is often considered to be a good thing in terms of preventing a lot of these GI problems, although it's not necessarily the perfect metric. I do think that exposing the body to a lot of these different environments is very important in the long run. You are never going to be able to heal if you hate what you're doing. Even if you have a hypothetical perfect diet down to the gram and down to the very ingredients, if you hate doing it and you feel like you're boxed in, you're never going to be able to heal that way. I think that you need to expand your life and continue to expand your lifestyle and your diet and the things that you're doing, and that eventually you'll get to where you want to be. The reality of the situation is that if you are struggling with one of these problems, you probably got into it in the first place because you were overly stressed. And the last thing that you want to do is make the healing process stressful. It should be the opposite. Another thing that's very important to discuss here is the use of antimicrobials or even antibiotics. Now, I discussed how the total fecal load or the total bacterial load is often elevated in these problems. And it's for that reason that oftentimes the use of antimicrobials can be extremely beneficial. So there are a number of different herbal protocols and herbal antimicrobials, most notably things like oregano oil or pau diarco. And there are even some formulated blends of different herbal antimicrobials that you can use. And I've heard a ton of good things about them. If the situation is extremely severe or calls for it, I definitely think that the pharmaceutical antibiotics do have a role. Again, this is not medical advice, but I have seen in a number of different scenarios that using the pharmaceutical antibiotics can be a literal life-saving intervention. This might be the most important step of all because everything else kind of depends on that bacterial load. I did talk before about how host health really dictates the bacterial composition. But if you're struggling with a really bad overgrowth, it's going to be paramount for you to address that first because all of your other efforts to increase your energy production may be completely worthless before you address that. And now I'm going to talk a little bit about probiotics. I want to start out by saying that the best probiotics act like antibiotics in the sense that they produce antimicrobial substances or they occupy niches in the gut where pathogens cannot. Now, I know I spent a good amount of time at the beginning of this video telling you why you may not want to take probiotics, but they do have quite a bit of utility if implemented correctly. The multi-strain probiotics tend to be better, so if you, if you are getting a lactobacillus and bifidobacterium blend, uh, ideally you get more strains of each. And then even better than that would be not just incorporating those two families, but other genuses and phyla of bacteria. Research seems to indicate that you should also probably try to do this for quite a bit of time, even months on end, in order to experience the proper benefits. So I had mentioned the lacto and bifido blends, which are very popular, but there are also a few different types of probiotics that you can use. There's also the soil-based probiotics, which are exactly what they sound like. They normally exist in soil, but they also inhabit our gut and tend to have a lot of antipathogenic and gut protective effects. And then there is the yeast S. bouillardii or bouillardii. I'm not really sure how to pronounce it, but it is very antipathogenic and antibacterial as well. Ideally, you can get all three of these in one, 
and implement it consistently, I think that has a pretty good chance of working. Then you have the bacteriophage products, which are a bit of a wild card in my opinion, but I've heard a lot of really good things about them. Basically, a bacteriophage is actually a virus that can kill bacteria in your gut. Now, one thing that is often misunderstood is that if you take an antimicrobial or an antibiotic alongside a probiotic, that they will cancel each other out. But that's actually not the case. They actually tend to work better in unison, which I think is really interesting and kind of goes to show that the best probiotics are antibiotics and that the best antibiotic approach will actually foster the right growth of bacteria in the gut. Now, I just kind of scratched the surface here, and there are a ton of different options that you can use to implement, but hopefully this gave you at least a good place to start. At the end of the day, individualized approaches and self-experimentation is the most important thing. Everyone is going to respond differently to these different protocols and different treatments, and once you find one thing that works, a light bulb is going to go off in your head, and you're going to start implementing more and more things, and then you'll really be onto something. But that is to say that it might take a little while in order to find the right combination of things to shift the gut bacteria balance in your favor, to increase the metabolism, to support the immune system, to increase motility, and ultimately to break yourself out of the lifestyle that you are currently living. Ultimately, Ray Pete said it best, authoritarians talk about protocols, but the only valid protocol is perceive, think, act. And again, that is why we started Prism Health Consulting. It is incredibly difficult to navigate this all on your own, especially if you're new to this. So it helps to have a team behind you with a lot of experience that can help you. Now, this is just the first of many videos on this topic. I hope you guys like the format. Uh, we are going to be having a lot more of this style of video coming out, especially as it pertains to the gut, more actionable things that you guys can seem to implement. There will be a lot more on this topic going forward. So thank you for watching. Uh, as always, don't let them fool you. I love you all. I wish you the best on your healing journey because it truly is a journey, uh, but ultimately you will be better off for it and uh, you will make it there at some point.